Come on, let's give Jesus one big one that he's worthy of. Whew. It is a good day to be together. I want to just thank you. Thank you for being a part of what God is doing. We have been experiencing some tremendous, unbelievable things taking place, and we know that God is just getting started. Would you agree with that? Let me just tell you quickly, just even last week, breakthrough. If you missed it, it's okay, but try not to miss the next one because God is doing something. There's a fresh wind and fresh fire on something that I didn't even know needed to be freshened up. It was powerful. It was amazing. So many miracles and healings taking place that night. So much freedom being brought that night. Let me just tell you one quick story. Had a young man brought in for the very first time. Family came for the very first time that Sunday. Brought in, had tumors riddling his entire spine. Was in a wheelchair going into the surgery the next day, and they believed every one of those tumors were full of cancer. They opened them up the next morning completely cancer-free. This is what Jesus and Jesus alone is doing, just not doing. And we kicked off the new year with the word of the Lord over our house for this year, which is it will be the year of breakthrough that we're going to see some things take place that we can't even imagine, things we've been hoping and dreaming and praying and anchoring our faith in and just standing and asking God, God, do what only you can do. And we kicked it off knowing how to position and posture ourselves for that. And one of the best combinations to do that is through prayer and fasting. So today is the 21 day of the 21 days of prayer and fasting. So we are gonna close out service today with communion and then we are going to feast. If you've not been eating, feast. If you've not been watching, watch. Do whatever it is that you have been abstaining from. Just, it's, I, I can't wait to eat. I'm just gonna be honest with you. I'm really, really hungry. I promise you're like super hungry. Had a dream the other night, Friday night. Had a dream, bizarre dream. Wonderful dream, bizarre dream though. I opened up my pantry door. In this dream, it's so short. Opened up my pantry door and from Floor to ceiling, wall to wall, was stacked shelves of H-E-B white powder donut holes just covered the wall. And I woke up so, so hungry, so hungry. So today I'll be getting me a big fat juicy ribeye and some white powder donut holes. Ain't that right, baby? Yeah, you got that noted? Check? All right. So we kicked it off looking at that and how to position postures of them. Pastor Jim Critcher came in amazing, amazing Sunday morning messages and then amazing breakthroughs we talked about. And now we got today. And today, what we're going to talk about here in just a moment is pursuing breakthrough. There's a quote, the proof of desire is found in the pursuit. In other words, how bad you really want something is only proven by how much you go after it. And we want breakthrough in our lives. We want breakthrough in our city. We want Jesus to notice that the remnant, the, the noisy ones have gathered together. And then he will rise up in the midst of us. He will go ahead of us and break us through. So if you've got your Bible today, you've got a smart device you're looking at the Bible on. If you've got nothing at all, you can use your hand. And I encourage you to bring something next week. Let's all be lifelong learners. Let's lift up whatever we have towards heaven. And let's make this declaration over our life and over the Lord. Say, Father God. Thank you for your word. Your word is a lamp to my feet, a light to my path. Your word changes me from the inside out. I'm ready to receive, willing to obey your holy word. In Jesus' name, amen. So I want to give you a little bit of sneak peek before we get into the message. Breakthrough is often the hardest right before it happens. Now, as you could tell, I've never given birth to a child. Yeah, surprise. But I've been in the room for my daughter's birth, I've been in the room for all four grandchildren's birth, and I know, just from eyewitness account, that the hardest time of the birthing is right as the child is breaching. In business and church planting, there are three major breakthroughs, three major hurdles, three years, five years, seven years. 95% of all churches close their doors from the day they start before they reach three years old. And then out of the 5% remaining, most of them close their doors before either the five or seven year. And it's the same with a lot of businesses that people start because it's hard. There's hard things to get through. And the, there's a, 
a little bit of a stat out there that isn't scientifically proven per se, but it's more a collection of thoughts and ideas that 99% of people quit right before the breakthrough. Today, I'm going to tell you, the message is life-giving, but it is going to start off with some labor pains. But the delivery, in the end, is going to be well worth it, so don't quit on what God wants to do in and through your life today, amen? So as we are looking for breakthrough and we want to pursue breakthrough, I think that you would agree with me that the best way to get to breakthrough is to get closest to the one who can provide it. So we want to be as close to God. We want to know him more intimately, relationally, and, and understand that as we probably heard the scripture, draw near to me and I will draw near to you. So God is telling us this is a partnership, that it takes two to tango. In the old school raw base, it takes two to make a thing go right. So God is saying, I took the first step. I loved you so crazy much I gave my best for you in Jesus. Now you take the next step and believe. Take that step of faith and believe. And then I'll take another step. And then you take another step. And the closer and closer we get to God, the more and more we become like him in his image. One translation says, come close to God and God will. It's a promise from God, come close to you. What we don't often hear or remember is what the back end of that same exact verse says. Because it actually teaches us how and why. So come close to God, God will come close to you. That's the what. That's the principle. And when you read the Bible, often the principle is mentioned first. And then the hows and the whys are mentioned afterwards. So if you want to know how to get there, you reverse engineer it and you start with the latter part, then the middle, then go to the first. So we're going to do that with James chapter 4. We're going to read it forwards and then backwards. Verse 8, come close to God and God will come close to you. That's the what. How do we do that? Well, we have to wash our hands. And this is spiritually speaking. And the King James says, all ye sinners. Can you look at me just for a moment? Take a deep breath. Look at me. That's all of us, including me. There's not a perfect person in this room. There's maybe one perfect person online, and that's only if Jesus is tuned in to the TV. (laughs) We have all sinned. We have all fallen short. That's why Jesus was sent. That's the purpose. So he's saying you need to recognize that this is who your carnal nature is. And once you recognize that, purify your hearts. This is super important because we are made in the image of God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. We are made body, soul, spirit. Body is the only temporal part of your being. From the ashes you were made until the ashes you will return. So from the dust of the earth, mankind was made, and from the dust of the earth, mankind does return, but our soul and our spirit live on forever. And our soul is our mind, will, emotions. It's how we think, what we feel, what we desire. And then our spirit is often referred to scripturally as your heart, the center or the core of who you are. That is your inner spiritual person. And it was made to relate directly to God. So he's saying first take care of body, then take care of, take care of heart. And then here's the why. For your loyalty is divided between God and the world. This is the age-old spiritual warfare fight that is being fought ever since Adam and Eve. God created us to have relationship with him. The devil hates it, and the devil's trying to get in the middle of it and divide. So he's trying to get us to care about what he cares about instead of what God cares about. God doesn't care about the things of this earth. He made it all. And there's nothing mankind can make that's going to outdo God. What he cares about is what he made, and that's us. That's all the animals of the earth. That's creation itself. He cares about the trees and the grass and the birds. He cares about it all. So when we're looking at this and understanding why, why is God asking for this? Well, it's because We have to make sure our loyalty is on the right side. It's what Jesus said in Revelation chapter 3 about the lukewarm spirit. I'd rather have you hot or cold. 
but please do not be lukewarm. What he's saying is, is I'd rather either have you sold out to the world or sold out to God, but don't, don't play the game of being in the middle. It's the most dangerous game because you get very confused and deceive your own self. So we want to make sure that we understand the why, and then how do we do that? Well, a cleansing and purification needs to take place so that we are not separate from God. You've heard this probably said in this way is that sin separates from God, us from God, but Isaiah 59 verse 2 is really what it bears out. Your iniquities are separating you from God. What is an iniquity? Well, all sin, let me just say it like this, all sin And this is all sin is. Sin, the word sin means to miss the mark, to fall short. We've all sinned, we've all fallen short. But iniquities are a lifestyle of sin. It's not I screwed up, messed up, now I need to fess up. No, it's like I keep going back to the same thing over and over and over and over again. We talked about it months ago with a coffee table analogy, coming down in the middle of the night, get a snack out of the fridge after the fast, stub your toe on the corner of the coffee table, and you let out some choice words. Welcome to the club. The choice word club, coffee table club, whatever we want to call it. But if you come down every night and hit your toe, same toe, every time, on the same spot of that coffee table, it's, it's probably time to get rid of the coffee table. Time to get that out of your life. So that's what an iniquity is. And it says, and your sins have hidden his face from you so he does not listen. This is super, super hard. Super hard on us when we get in this position because I'm going to tell you why. The term favor of God, what that term bears out in the original language to mean is God has turned his face to you. That God has fixed his gaze upon you that you have caught God's attention. We want that favor of God on our life. And so we do not want God hiding his face from us. We want him turning his face to us. So all of this said, like, how do, we, how do we work this out? Like, what are the principles that we can grab a hold of to continue to see ourselves? This is why the scripture says we will be taken from glory to glory, made better and better, stronger and stronger. But how? Before I get into it, so I'm going to tell you, but when I bought my very first house, it was in Columbus, Ohio, just got out of the Marine Corps, entered into vocational ministry, very first house I owned, and in the backyard in Columbus, Ohio, they had the Garden of Eden. I mean, all these perennial plants. They even had palm trees. I was like, I don't know how a palm tree survives in Ohio. I'm very confused by that. I found out it's actually a cold weather palm tree. Didn't know those existed. Now, the problem for that for me is I'm not a green thumb. I'm a black thumb. I kill stuff on, on accident. And so I got these perennial plants. That I was told it was like $15,000 worth of plants put in this backyard. I'm like, I barely paid that for this whole house. Man, y'all put a lot of money in there. And all of a sudden I had a tree similar to this where it had many sturdy, thicker branches growing right out of the bottom of it. It was beautiful, blossomed this spring. It was super cool. But after living there almost a year, when I got... The next season coming around, all of a sudden I noticed the tree, there's two of them. One next to it was beautiful and stayed full from the, from the bottom to the top. But the one particular one that was the problem was looking a lot like this, where it was just missing everything down on the bottom branches. And then as I looked closer, I noticed that there was stuff eaten away like it was decaying the branches and the leaves that were closest to the ones that were already stripped. And then this was... Still looking kind of good, but was not looking the best as it compared to the other tree. And so I called a friend of mine. He's a gardener, botanist of some sort. And I said, help. I need help. I don't know what to do. He comes over to the house. He gets back in the backyard. He's looking around this thing, putting his hand on his hip, and he's letting out a kind of hmm, hmm. Then he gets out on his hands and his knees, and he's crawling around the tree. I mean, like Inspector Gadget. He's got... Like a magnifying glass. I was like, dude, this dude knows what he's doing. This guy's really awesome. He's serious about this. And he's like, oh, oh. I'm like, oh, I don't know what any of this means, but I'm with you. What does this mean? He said, come here, come here, let me show you. Have you used a weed whacker around this tree? Of course I have. What else would you use? He said, well, you would use your hands around living plants and stuff like that. You don't 
use a weed whacker. Let me show you how you had cut into one of these main branches with the weed whacker, and now it's got infected. There's a break, and now it's been breached. And he starts talking me through this, and he's like, and the problem with that is, is that the tree wants the whole thing to live. So what's happening now is the tree is sucking the life out of the living part, trying to resurrect something that doesn't belong. It's trying to bring back to life something that is now dead. And the longer you let this go, and that's why it's climbing up to each branch above it, the longer you let it go, all you're doing is giving this tree a very slow death. I said, then what do I got to do? He said, well, you have to cut off the dead things, the things that are unhealthy. You got to remove that so that the tree will become even stronger. He said, when you remove the branches, the dead things, the tree actually becomes stronger, can grow taller, and will grow new branches that are alive. And I'm standing there stunned, literally eyeballs filled with sweat. So much so that they're like starting to leak down on my face. I don't know what you call that, but because the Holy Spirit is speaking to me and he's saying, and so it is with your life, son. The things from your childhood, the things from your young adulthood, the things from your rebellious times in life, the things when you didn't believe, all of that has caused wounds and fractures. And the longer you allow any of it to remain with you, then the new thing that I've done in you will always struggle to thrive. And I was, okay, God. So number one principle for today if we want to pursue breakthrough and pursue the one who delivers it, then we've got to learn it's time to prune our life. And when I say it's time, some of us have a little bit of pruning to do. Some of us may have a little bit more pruning to do. But the bottom line is, is this isn't, you prune this tree once, this part will get healthy and grow stronger, but come down the road, it's going to need pruned again. Jesus said it like this, if your right eye causes you to stumble, this is pretty savage, but it's not literal. I cannot express this to you enough today. No elbowing spouses, this is not literal. Walking next to a dude's got one eye left. I'm like, no, that was not literal. If your right eye causes you to stumble, cut it out. Throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Throw it away. It's better to lose one more part of your body than for your whole body to go to hell. What is Jesus saying? He's not saying literally self-mutilate your body, chop yourself. If this was the case and this was literal, I would be a nub up here today. (laughs) A literal nub. No hands, no arms, no feet, no legs, no head. Just a nub. Chest down, maybe. Maybe belly button talking to you in a very strange, weird way. You would no longer be here. Like that was the freakiest thing I've ever seen in my life. I'm not going back. So what is Jesus saying? He's saying that we have to get rid of the stuff that doesn't belong. Whether that's trauma, whether that's the need for freedom, healing, whether that's things that we're doing that we shouldn't be doing or things we should be doing that we're not doing, but we need, to, we need to get rid of some stuff so the new thing that Jesus has done can grow and can thrive and can produce even more and stronger than it could have holding on to the damaged parts of our life. Are you all here? And here's the good news. It's going to get just even better. Listen to this now. You actually, you have a part to play, but you can't do that. Only Jesus can. But you've got to give him the opportunity to get the work in your life. And that's number two, is you've got to let the word work. And to let the word work, you've got to be in the word daily. 
I don't care if it's one verse a day. I know people get frustrated when I say that. They're like, oh, you got to tell them to do more. No, if it starts there, I know you'll want more because it is the word of God is alive and it is powerful. The Greek says it activates something within us. It is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword. Cutting between the soul and and the spirit. What does that mean? That means that God is going to cause, when you read the word, a face-off to take place within your being. Your soul and your spirit are about to be in a Mexican standoff, Clint Eastwood style. Millennials and Gen Zs are like, who is Clint Eastwood? What is a Mexican standoff? It's too much to explain, don't have time. But you understand what I'm saying. You're going to have to decide, do I want to follow what I think is best, what I want, what I desire, how I feel today? Am I going to act and react on all of that? Or am I going to read the word, get the word in me, let the word work in me, let it start to divide some stuff up so that I can see where I need to prune? So the word actually shows it to us. It's not you have to, and it's nobody else's job. Are you listening now? Scripture says, go out and bring those to judgment once you are perfect. <laughs> Whoo, okay, that day's not coming to the day you're with Jesus, so that option's out. We're not here to judge, criticize. We're here to empower, to love, to equip, to train. We're here. We're here to be a breath of fresh air into somebody's life. I'm here to be an ear, to be a listener. And so whatever it is that's, that's happening in our life that's holding us back, that, that weight that just weighs you down, that sin that so easily trips you up, whatever that is, that, that sin for you is different than the sin for me, just like mine may be different from hers, and hers is different from his. It's all different, but the bottom line is if you want the most from God, you've got to get the closest to God. And if you want to get close to God, then you're going to allow God to begin to do a work within you to put to death that thing or those things that do not belong. The scripture is very clear, but let me just tell you what sin is. Sin is not just a list that God one day got bored and was like, hey, I don't want you doing that. I don't like that. No, nah, we're going to put that. No, you know, keep, don't ever do that. You know, all sin scripturally, every one of them, all lead to pain in either your life or someone else's life. All sin just, all it does, it's actions that hurt others or hurt yourself. Case in point, if you're in a group of, of gals or guys and you guys tend to talk about everybody else's business, well, that's sin. That's called gossip. You probably should get into a small group with like-minded believers where you get to talk and focus on what Jesus is going to do in people's lives. If you're jealous of what somebody else has, then stop getting in everybody else's business and worry about what they have. Are you listening? Like, I'm speaking to myself. I'm just telling you, like, in the end, none of us are perfect. We all have something along that list. If drinking leads to drunkenness, see, drinking is not a sin in the Bible, and the church is just really, really try to control people in all these radical religious ways. There is no sin of drinking a drink in the Bible. Jesus turned water into wine. It's the first miracle. My Lord. And they said it was the best wine anybody ever had. Now, I'm not encouraging you to drink. I'm just telling you it's not a sin, but drunkenness is. So if you can't drink without getting drunk, stop drinking altogether. That's what it looks like to cut stuff out. That's what it looks like to get rid of it. That's what it looks like for the word to bring. If it's pornography, then get rid of your computer and your smartphone. You're like, my God. <laughs> you old school dinosaur. It's 2024. I've lived long enough to where I know over half of my life never had a computer, never saw one because it didn't exist. Never had a smartphone, didn't exist. I remember. You know what I'm talking about? Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. Some young people are like, what is this dude doing up here? He says, this is mine. It's called a rotary phone. Hey, before that, there was a And before that, there was a letter. <laughs> I, 
I got young people, they like that letter. Oh, dude, you crazy. Let me type that out. So whatever it is, if it's wealth, if, if materialism becomes a, a thing to you, then just give it away. You can't take it with you anyway. I'm not saying you have to. I'm just saying if it causes you, then get rid of it. Are you listening now? This is what we have to do. We have to let the word work within us and highlight. The word will do all this. You don't need somebody else to do it. And you don't need to be hard on yourself all the time either. Hear that. Stop beating yourself up all the time. None of us are perfect. Join the club. Let's move on. Let's get better. But when you start to get in the word, the word starts to highlight these things. Now what do I do with it? Okay, the word showed me, man, I'm dealing with pride right now. I'm a little puffed up. I see this. Pride comes for the fall. I don't want to fall. What do I do, Jesus? What am I supposed to do with this? Am I supposed to all of a sudden just <laughs> woo saw my pride away? No. Number three, when you figure it out, you give it to Jesus. Whatever it is. He said, come to me, all of you who are heavy burdened, who are weighted down with sin, who are sad, who are who are carrying guilt, bring it to me. I paid the price for it, and I want to lift it off of you. Titus 3, 5 says, Jesus saves us. Not because of the righteous things we had done. Are you hearing that? There's no prayer you could pray. There's no penance you could pay. There's no beads that can do this for you. There's no sign of the cross. There's none of that. It's all religion. None of that can free you. But Jesus can. And he will. When you say, Jesus, man, I don't know how to deal with this. I'm working on that. I told you. I'm honest with you. Driving here in Austin, it's a problem. It's an issue. I'm working. I just had a, a young lady. I'm so thank God for her. She came up to me and she said, you know what? I fasted and prayed. You know what I did? I fast. God told me, the Holy Spirit told me, you're not allowed to be angry one day in this entire fast. I was like, oh. She's like, it changed my life. I'm like, I know what to fast for next time. <laughs> Note taken. Had another guy say, Pastor, I lost 30 pounds during this fast. I was like, dude, that's awesome. He goes, yeah, fasting's better than meth. I was like, wow, it is. Promise you, every bit of it's way better than anything's better than meth. You know what I'm saying? Like, but I'm glad you're here at City Research and we're experiencing the goodness of God, right? Like, come on. I gotta, I gotta wrap up. I'm getting, getting, look at this. This is the best part. How does this happen? Well, it's because of His mercy. You see, his grace abounds and his mercy endures forever. And mercy is unmerited forgiveness. So Jesus, forgive me. I've fallen short. I've sinned. I've, I've messed up. And Jesus, I give this to you. I do not want this a part of my life. And we read it two weeks ago that Jesus will always show you the way out. And look what he does in return of us going to him to receive that mercy, he washes away our sins, giving us a new birth. Ah, so uh, what am I doing here? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to break that off my life because the word highlighted it. It was sharper than any two-edged sword. It divided my soul and my spirit, and I'm bringing it as an offering to Jesus, saying, I don't want this anymore. I need you to take it. I'm giving it to you, Jesus. I'm laying it on your altar his mercy comes. His cleansing comes. The blood that washes away all sins comes. And all of a sudden, new birth starts to take place. And new life starts to come through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Can we give God one big thank you for his word today?